Well, I'm looking at Genesis 4. We, we're in this discussion in verses 1 through 4 where we have the family, Adam and Eve, and their children, are, Adam and Eve have been exiled from the garden. The garden has been shut down, the Garden of Eden, and so they've had to move out into the east of Eden. And they're living there, and now they've got a family, and all of a sudden we've gone from a couple who just got married to a family who's got grown kids. That's a, I've said that before. That's pretty amazing. I, mean, I guess we all wish we could do that. Just in one, one or two verses, have them grown up and doing it doing out. But uh, anyhow, so what we have in this is that there came a special time um, how the writer said it. Well, let me just read it. Now the man had relationships with his wife Eve. She conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, in regard to Cain, I have gotten a bad child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to a, a second child, Abel. Abel was a keeper of the flock, flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. This was their careers. Now, there's a special phrase in the Hebrew, and I mentioned this once before to you. You can't quite see that in English. But here's what it says in the English, at least in the New American Standard. It says, so it came about in the course of time. And I did a whole study with you on that idea. We live our lives in a course of time. Right? We say, well, you know, I was a child, I went to school here, and then I went to high school there, and then I went to the service, or I got married, and then we moved here, and we, he worked there, and we moved around. There's, our life is, is a journey of a course of time. And the, the Bible wants us to be aware that that course of time that's been set has been set by God. And a lot of times we don't see that. We know we're in the course of time that we're going through transitional points of our life, you know, as a child and then as a teenager and then a young adult and then a senior adult and all that. We know that our life is in a course of change. But here's what this wants you to know, that that course of life, once you get saved, you enter into that, that course of life is at work. But when you get saved, you enter into that course of life differently in that now you realize that course of life deals with the will of God. Before that, I, I, was, I, was, I was 23 before I got saved. I knew there, I was in a course of life, but I didn't know how it was controlled. I thought it was controlled by me. Right? In other words, at some point, my, it was controlled by my parents, and at another point, it was controlled by me. It was whether I went to college and whether I went to class and whether I graduated and all of that. But when I got saved, I'm still in a course of life, but now it's based on God's will for my life and not my own or somebody else's. And that's a significant piece of information here that's given to us. In this little phrase, uh, so it came about in the course of time, and it's dealing with Cain and Abel, the two boys. Cain brought an offering. And so this, this, what this means in the Hebrew idea is a rite of passage. This course of time, there was a course of time when they stepped into a specific issue in their life. This is the second time this would have occurred to them in the Hebrew. The first time is when they chose a career and it was a rite of passage in Hebrew. And, and that's discussed there. It says that one became a keeper of the flock and the other a tiller of the ground. But this now is a second rite of passage and this deals with salvation. Here's what it says. Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. They're both bringing offerings. 
we get a real clue on what the offering is about with Abel's offering. We're not, we don't even know if the other boy just brought vegetables or grains or we don't know what he brought because his offering wasn't accepted. We only know the offering that they were supposed to bring, only one was going to be accepted. All right. Abel, on his part, brought the firstlings of the flock and the fat portions. This is an offering for atonement of sin. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Because this, this, this offering, they were both supposed to come to a rite of passage for salvation, dealt with sin, an offering for sin to enter into salvation. This is really important, and you're going to see how this plays out in the life of these two people. The Lord said to Cain, Cain got angry. Well, look at verse 6, uh, verse 5. But, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became fair, very angry, and his countenance fell. I'll explain that. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? One question. And why has your countenance fallen? Second question. Cain did not bring the offering that God willed him to bring. He brought what he thought would be good for God. Listen, God knows what's good for him. You don't have to determine what's good for God. Well, what you have to determine is what's good for you on, on the basis of God. And so Cain, 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 and so he asked Cain two questions after the offering was rejected. This shows the patience of God to try to get people saved. He said, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door and his desire is for you, but you must master it. I'll talk about that next time. What does that mean? We'll talk about it next time. But this time, we're going to talk about seven things. We're going to talk about seven things, seven spiritual truths that Cain didn't consider important. Just blow them off. Now, you may be one of those people here today. If not, you know people like this. And this is serious stuff. This is not, this is pretty serious stuff. Now, listen. I want to talk about these seven things today in my first lesson. Then the second hour, I'm going to talk about what do you do when you get mad at God and won't give it up? What do you do when you get mad at God and won't, won't, won't give it up? We'll talk about that next hour. We'll talk about how you get there, and why you stay there, and why it's a bad choice. But first, Cain didn't consider the fallen state. Here's what he didn't consider important. Cain didn't consider the fallen state of all mankind in Adam's original sin as important. Didn't consider it. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. Do you not know that because of Adam's sin in Genesis 2, 17, where he was told, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day you eat, die and you will die. That was a death penalty. Do you understand that was a death penalty? Well, die and you will die. That's a heavy judicial penalty. If you eat from that tree, eat from any trees you want to eat, but if you eat from that tree, die and you will die. Paul said in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse five, okay, let's just slide over there a moment to Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 12. Now watch this. Therefore, just as through one man centered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. 
that one man he's talking about, therefore, as through one man sin entered the world and death by sin, that's a, that, that's a spiritual death from sin. He's talking about Adam. You say, how do you know that? Because I've read the rest of this. I've read the rest of the story here. Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam. The sin death comes from Adam. This one man he's talking about is Adam in context. We're part of a human race. Now, if somebody comes along and tells you you're not a human being, yeah, are you going to believe that? We're believing such foolishness today. If somebody comes and says, well, you're not a human. Listen, I heard a girl the other day said this, that she believed in her heart she was a cat. And she wanted to be, listen, that, that's, that stuff under normal conditions, that would be funny. Listen, let the word of God tell you who you are. One thing is going to tell you as a human being, you were born in sin. That's what he's going to tell you. Well, wherefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world that of humans, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish. Do what? Perish. But if you will believe in his son, you will have eternal life, which is the opposite of perish. Well, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men for all have sinned in Adam. So Cain is told this. He's not, he's aware of this. He's been told this. This is exactly what he's been told. Now let me see if I can get this thing. Tell me the two things I hit. <coughs> Control and tab. Okay. 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 Here's what I want you to do. See under point one? Draw two little circles. <laughs> Let's go kindergarten. Draw two little circles. I can't get this thing to work for me. Some days it'll work for me and other days it won't because I don't play with it enough. Did you write two little circles? In the circle on the left, write Adam and put a dot in it. Put the dot, a dot in the middle of the circle and write the name Adam. In the other circle, put a dot and write the word Christ. Now I want you to do something good. We're in Romans, so let's turn, to, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's, let's turn over there, and then I'm going to want you to write this down on your, on your paper by those two circles. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Watch this. Watch this now, because I want you to write again. Watch what it says. For as in Adam all die. Right? That first circle, we got Adam, got a dot in it. That dot's you. And we all start out dead. See? If you're an Adam, you're what? Dead. dead. Spiritually. That's a spiritual death. Well, look, I, I didn't make this stuff up. For in, in Adam, positionally, in Adam all die, so also in Christ. Now, see the other circle over there on the right? Write the word Christ. You got a dot there, right? You're either in Adam or in Christ. There's no third place. You with me? I I don't have a third square. I don't have a third circle. I want to say square, but circle. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. Now, here's what he says: If you're in Christ, you're what? Alive. Look, you will be made alive. What are you in Adam? Dead. What are you in Christ? Made alive. You're in one of them. Amen. Everybody's in one of them. I don't care if you're the president or the pope or whoever you are. There's no exceptions to this rule. 
You're in one of them. The question is, we start out in, in Adam, agreed? <clears throat> well, then write down by the circle that says Adam, write down Romans 12, uh, 5, 12, because that's what it says. Now watch. I want you to, I'm in, Col I'm in, I'm in 1 Corinthians, so let's go, let's, let's go over to Colossians. I, I'm going to teach you Willie's favorite, this is Willie's favorite stuff right here. Willie and I live off of this stuff right here. In between the two circles, have you got an in between, a little in between? How you doing, my man? Eh? Now you watch Willie. Willie going to teach you. In between these two circles, put a cross, put a line down like this, and an, and, a, and one that goes straight up with a, like an arrow. Because what that represents is Jesus dies on a cross, he's buried, and he's raised from the dead. That's called the gospel. He didn't die for his sins, he died for yours. Agreed? Oh, yeah. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that gets us out of Adam and into Christ. You in Colossians? Well, I gave you enough time to get to Colossians. Colossians 1.13. Watch this now. Now, you go, now, did you put that cross? Now, he, I, this is a little homework here. This is a little stuff. Class, this is class study. We're going to do something here in a moment. It's going to really be. Did you put the cross and the stuff there? Yes. All right. Now watch what he, watch what Paul says. Because how we get out of Adam and into Christ. Watch this. It says, "For he rescues us from the domain of darkness." Over there in Adam is the domain of darkness. And he transfers us into the kingdom of the beloved son. If you're in Christ, you're in the beloved kingdom of the son. If you're in Adam, you're in the domain of darkness. Agreed? Well, I'm really, I'm just not asking for consent on that. I'm just saying, are you seeing it? Now watch this. Go to the middle, the, the cross, you know where they, they cross and make a plus sign? Go right there. And take and make a loop over to Adam. And then take, go back to that point and make a loop over to Christ. You got two loops? Watch this now. Go to the cross and just take a line and, and make a go over the top to Adam. Are you with me? Then go back to the cross and make another loop over there to Adam, uh, to Christ. Are you with me? You got that? Now, when you believe the gospel of Christ, that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give you eternal life. The moment you believe, watch this now. That loop that went over to, went, went over to uh, Adam, you with me? Mark an R above it. R. Like Ronald R. Listen to what he says. For he rescues us from the domain of darkness. A rescue mission. Jesus Christ on the cross is a, is a rescue mission for those that are in Adam. Do you understand that? He's going to rescue you. You can't rescue yourself. There's no way out of there. Right? You're under 13 judicial... Judicial penalties of Adam's sin. Now watch. On the other loop that takes you from the cross into Christ is the word transfer. So put a T up there. Watch this now. He rescues us from the domain of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of the beloved son. You know what, that, you know what those two acts are? And aren't they wonderful? On the one hand, we're rescued like a POW, and we go, he goes in and gets them out of there and transfers them over here. All of that's a picture of grace. He rescues you by grace. He transfers you by grace so that 
You are saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Isn't that marvelous? Okay. It says in verse 14, in whom, the beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the first piece that Cain has ignored, rejected. I can bring my own. I can put in the middle of these two crosses a bowl of fruit, and it'll be okay. I'll make a fruit salad that will just knock your socks off. You'll never eat a fruit salad like I'll bring to the table. He brings that ta to the table of salvation. It has to be rejected because it has to be a blood offering that take care of the sin of Adam. Right? So one of the first one of the first mistakes that he makes is he doesn't see the importance of why he needs to be saved. Well, I'm okay guy. I haven't done any that don't matter if you're an okay guy or not I'm an okay guy. I don't care if you're a hundred percent good or a hundred percent bad, you can both be saved and both need to be saved. Well, I'm not. well anyhow. Here's the second thing. Out of seven, Cain didn't consider the personal need for a substitutional blood atoning sacrifice of salvation, which would have been shadow Christology in the Old Covenant, a prophetic gospel. One day Christ would come, he would die on a cross, be buried and raised. See, he didn't understand that the substitutional blood offering that needed was outside himself. He thought he could produce it within himself, that he could determine what was a good offering and what wasn't a good offering. And as a, a good farmer, he could do that. But this is not why he's there. He's a sinner. This offering is your idea. When you walk up to that altar, you've got to have the right offering because you're a sinner in need of salvation. And a fruit bowl ain't going to do it. Whatever your offering is that you bring, if it's not the blood of Jesus Christ, it's, not, it's worthless for your salvation. What will wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. So, at point number two, he didn't consider his personal need <clears throat> of a blood atoning. Listen, the sinless blood of Christ is the offering for your salvation. He, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. My, my, my. And listen, and listen, you may be sitting there going like, I've heard this so many times, Ron. I know this. I'm, I'm there. You know, then why it's, you know why it's being taught again? For you to share it with somebody. That's why he repeats. All good teachers keep repeating subjects. I have no idea what the Lord, why he wants that ser sermon that I've got. I have no idea. I just do what I'm told. I have no idea who's coming and who's not. Well, I give you several passages. For example, Romans 3, 23, 24. That's a very good, I just quoted 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Here's Hebrews 9, 14. How much more the blood of Christ, how much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse your conscience. Watch this now. Cleanse your conscience from what? What's it say? Dead works. You know what? You know what Cain brought? He brought dead works. And you know the only thing that can cleanse that 
concept or that conscience, you know the only thing that can change that? Well, listen to this. How much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. What is it? Cleanse your, heart, cleanse, cleanse your conscience? The blood of Christ from dead works. That's what happened to Abel because he brought the right offering. He brought an offering for sin. It didn't work for Cain because he brought works. If he'd have turned his heart and said, okay, I, geez, I was wrong. Let me go get, can you wait a minute? I'll go get a blood uh, offering. Yeah, we'll wait for you. Listen, God is patient to wait this long. You wait a little more. Go get it and bring it. But he didn't. Had he offered that, then his conscience would have been cleansed from what? Dead works. Dead works. And that's something. Here's the third, third thing that Cain didn't consider. God's requirement of judicial forgiveness as important. Cain didn't consider God's requirement of judicial forgiveness of Adam's sin of Genesis 2.17 as important for, listen, for mercy pardon. You know, we all get, listen, when you come to salvation, you all get pardoned by the mercy of God. You're under 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin, and not one of them can you pay on your own. Not one. And he pays it all for you. All to him I owe my debt. His, he has wiped clean. My, my, my people. Here are some great passages for you to study. You should study Ephesians 1, 7. You should read Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. You should read Titus 3, 4 through 7 and Hebrews 4, 16. I don't write these passages down here for you not to read, right? I tell you, when I, I might read one of them, but I want you to go home and read them all. I want you to see what a marvelous salvation you have gotten by grace. My, my, my. Well, I gave you Titus 3, 5. Listen to this. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. See, that was Cain. Abel brought what God said you got to bring for a sin offering. That's what he did. He saved us not on, but according to his mercy. See mercy? That's what you don't deserve. That brings the justice of God to bear upon your life. Mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Here's the fourth thing. Cain didn't consider as important that the object, listen to this, that the object of his saving faith was also outside himself. <laughs> everybody, everybody taking a look. I love that. As somebody didn't know, they parked their car here and didn't know where it was parked. You ever walked, have you ever walked out of a, 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 a shopping place that's really packed out, and you can hear these things going off all over. <laughs> yeah, one of them's mine. I don't ever remember where I parked. I like it when they used to put they used to put numbers up there on your aisle or on your parking space. Well, I, I could remember. Oh, I had 13, 13 where I came for thirteen. Uh, well, yeah. The object. It's always about the object of your faith. And for salvation, of course, it's the gospel. Genesis 3.15, Cain should have understood well because he was close to the, to the time period of Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman was the Savior. The seed of the woman. And he should have understood uh, Genesis 3.21 when they had to make an offering and use the skin of the animal uh, as a garment. Cain didn't consider the prophetic gospel of grace, salvation, and Christ as essential to salvation. Listen to Romans 3, 28. Being justified. You, you know what you got? When God says you are justified, you know what you have? You have the, pen, the judicial penalty paid for. 
You are pardoned by the mercy of God because of the blood of his son. Being justified, I don't know that we really understand that as well as we should. That we, we now in our salvation sit under the justice, the justice of God. He always will deal with us that way. Being justified as a gift by his grace through redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. And we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. See, justified by works. Justified by faith apart from works. Five, Cain didn't consider as important the power, watch us now, of the evil thinking of the cosmic system. When you're an atom over here in the domain of darkness, right on your paper, you put down the domain of darkness over there by Adam. Do you know whose domain you're in? The devil. <laughs> ah, yeah. Well, write this down over by domain of darkness. Write this little passage down. 1 John 5, 19. I mean, he's the angel of darkness and everybody who follows his thinking and he is the God of this world of the domain of darkness. He stands in opposition to the things of God. On the other side, you have God. You're either in the, in the cosmic system, the worldly system of evil thinking, or you're in the word of God in Christ through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the righteousness of God. Operating in the righteousness of God. Yeah. Depends on where you are in your life. And what is the object of your faith? <clears throat> well, you should read 1 John 5, 4 and 5, and verse 19. You should read John 17, 15, Colossians 2, 13 through 15. You, listen to this. You know where faith comes from? The bird of paradise flies in and no, nah, I don't think so. Romans 10, 17 tells you. Where does faith come from? You know, faith is such faith, everything's about faith, isn't it? Faith, 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 faith. The whole Bible is about faith. There's a whole chapter in Hebrews 11, faith. Well, chapter, faith. It sure does. You know where that's found? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That's the way, that's the, way the Christian operates. What's the Bible say? You don't, make, you don't make these big decisions or small decisions apart from the word of God. What's the Bible say? You got a Bible. You know what you don't know? One day, one day I'm going to come and all I'm going to do is teach you how to use your Bible. People buy a Bible. You should buy a good study Bible. Then you, before you start reading it, you should see how it works. You ever tried to teach somebody that grew up driving an automatic shift to shift drive and put them on a hill? I mean, you, you will faint before they get to the top of the hill. And everybody behind them will be honking. Well, listen, the word of God. Do you know you have a wonderful concordance back here? If you go like... I know, where does that, where can I find it? If you get the key word, you can find the verse. Or if you got the verse, you can find the key word. You ought to read your, you ought to study. Where can I get all these? You know, people come in and they go like, I can say, well, let's turn to. Lamentations, the fourth chapter, verse three. And everybody go, they, they go like, nah, I wouldn't have a clue where Lamentations so they don't look it up because they, 
but they, they could go to the context in the front of their Bible, right? And they could look up, oh, there it is. It's on page five something, and boom, there you are. Be, you know, I give you a pass if you're illiterate, and if you're not, you have no pass. I've pastored churches where people were illiterate. And the first thing I did is hold classes to teach them how to be literate. That, that's no unexcus it's unexcusable to be, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I mean, it's just that simple. Teach them the alphabet, and off the alphabet comes words, and words become sentences, and then the first thing you know, they, give, they can read a sign. Nobody in, nobody in America ought to be illiterate. Well, anyhow, we, here's, here, here's a point. 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God. We know that we are of God. Do you have that confidence? Yeah. Buddy, well, you should if you believe that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. I know, I don't lie. Listen, I'm not in that domain, and listen, I'm not, listen, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. I'm not going to live in that world. I'm not going to operate in it. I live in it, but I'm not going to operate in it. Here's point four. King didn't consider that. Watch this now. Oh, I run into this so much in the pastorate. I never believed I would ever see it in the South. I saw it as a young man in the North. Depravity. But I'm telling you, it's everywhere today. Cain didn't consider the depth of depravity of evil thinking. We're into evil thinking today in America. Now, you know it, and I know it. They, they, they can tell the difference between a, a boy and a girl. I want to change our pronouns and all this kind of stuff. What are you talking about? By now, you must know we're up to our eyeballs in evil. Every once in a while, they'll capture somebody just brutally beating somebody senseless for no reason at all. They go, well, they're nuts. Well, of course they are. We would have never, when I was a kid, we would have never considered it any other way than nutty in a fruitcake. Of course they have to be sent away. And they, they need to be checked out if they're, if they're not eating a fruitcake. Let's take the nutty part out of it. Well, here's the problem with this. If you think it's only going to stay up here, you're wrong. This stuff is going to go deep where you won't recognize America nor the people in it. My, 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 by certain, by certain, you must know this by now. Huh? Either that or turn your television back on for just a moment. My son gets after me every week that I, I watch the news too much, and I know that. And I get so, hmm. Yeah, you see, I know. Cain didn't consider the depth of depravity of the evil thinking as important. He's into evil thinking. Doesn't even give a second thought. He's into evil thinking. It's only going to, it's only going to take you down. It's not going to lift you up. And Jesus said it. Listen, you, you know how you know how evil drags you down? You know how you can see it? Listen, he said, countenance. In their countenance. Do you know when your countenance fall, what you have? I'll talk about this later one day to you. Do you know what you have when your count? He said your countenance is falling, right? You know what you got? Listen to me now. See, you're made up of a body, soul, and spirit. You're a trichotomous person. Body, soul, and spirit. First Thessalonians 5.23. You're, that's who you are. Listen to me. When God, op when God puts good in you, these three things fall in line with it. It's magnificent. The devil runs the same thing with evil. 
And when you see a, a countenance fall, that's, that's like your britches on, your, uh, on the floor. Your body, your soul, and your spirit have been captured 100% into evil. And that's why depravity goes down. That's why depravity, evil takes you into depravity. That's the elevator going down. And he uses that, and he uses that as an example. I, I read that. You didn't pay attention, but that's okay. I read that in, in Genesis 4, 5 through 7. And if you if you if you come, you can get yourself out of that. It will it will put you in an elevator up. It's not the goodness of God that tears up your life and makes you your countenance fall all the time. You're just a miserable person to be around. You should be getting sick of yourself by now. I don't know. I'm glad you're here, though. You know what he's talking about, that countenance falling? That's depravity taking you down. I wrote this on my paper to myself, so I'll read it to you. I wrote it this morning. Depravity gets you so deep into evil that you can't climb out of it. Cain's a perfect example of that. So was Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. They got so deep, they couldn't get out. They, they, there was no way in their mind that they could put any logical sense to their life to be able to climb back out. God could have pulled them out. But they weren't willing to go there. I gave you 1 John 3, 12. And I wrote it. Not as Cain who was the evil one and murdered his brother. And for what reason? Motive. See, we always want motive. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. There should be his deeds were evil in there. It should be his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. What, what, he got, and he got mad at God. He got mad at God. All God wanted to do is rescue him, transfer him. I want to rescue and transfer you. And uh, Here's my closing point. Cain didn't consider as important Watch this now, the long-suffering patience of God towards sinners. Man, if there's breath in your body, you can climb out of whatever mess you're in with the help of God. It's called grace. His mercy, His mercy is so phenomenal, it'll reach down into the depths of depravity and pull men up. Did you know that? I've seen him do it more times than I could tell you about. I have seen him reach into the depravity of the human soul and lift people out of it who were willing to come by faith. Have you not known people like that? How long have you been a Christian not known that? And you need to stretch your life out a little bit and take a look around. It ha happens all the time. And listen, the wonderful thing is catch them young. A lot of them are already in deep, deep depravity, and they're very young. Willie rescues them every day who are sliding into the muck and mire of depravity. It's a tough, it's a tough, it's a tough. But listen, at any age you can get them. I had a great ministry at Ketona Retirement. Now, nah, you don't know that, does it matter? With people that were good. 
just in terrible shape and hopeless. You don't have to remain there, though. We had a wonderful ministry inside that place bringing hope back to people's life that thought they were a cooked goose in a retirement home uh, run by the, the county and the state. Nobody came to visit them. Then we show up. We go around and love on them and, and teach them and bring them into faith in Christ. And then the first thing you know, they began to do it within their own sphere of influence. It's a wonderful thing. Do you know anybody like that? Have you looked around your neighborhood to see if there's anybody like that in that kind of a mess? Have you offered them anything? You want a great, you want a great missionary work? Look around for that. Now, I'm just saying, that's what I do. Point seven in closing. The long-suffering patience of God that we've been talking about. Second Peter 3, 9. God is not willing that any perish, but that all would come to repentance. God is, God is not willing. I close with this, Romans, the second chapter 4 and 5. Do you think lightly of the, do you think lightly? Isn't that an interesting way to say that? Do you think lightly of the riches of the kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepented heart, you are, you are storing up, that should be up, wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Do you realize that he offered, even though he said, Cain, I can't accept that? He offered him an opportunity to, to amend that. You know why? Because God wants you to be saved. And he wants every member of your family to be saved. Did you know that? Hmm? Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way and studied with us. The things that Cain didn't consider important that were essential. And he went through a process of denial and doom. How pitiful that is. The firstborn of Adam and Eve with the right to claim heir to the Messianic seed. Not only did he not accept it, but he murdered his brother who could have and was used by the devil to destroy the lineage of Jesus Christ at that point in human history. What a terrible thing. What a terrible thing. Let us not be part of that evil working. Let us be part of that righteousness even if it costs us, it's important for us to live the righteous life. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.